Hello, and welcome back to Horror Story Podcast. It's me, Trish, your host, and this week I've got a shorter episode for you all because... It's Halloween weekend, and I'm just super selfless and thoughtful and wanted to make sure that you had time to listen to the podcast and get your spooky on. I've also made a whole ass Spotify playlist of all my favorite creepy, kooky, mysterious, and spooky songs that I feel fit the vibe of the podcast. It'll hopefully become the soundtrack to all of your Halloween festivities or just your daily life. So be sure to give it a listen. I'll link it in the show notes and also post it to the podcast Instagram. This week, fittingly, I'm diving into two well-known Halloween urban legends that specifically surround trick-or-treating. And those are poison candy and razor blades in apples. Reported cases of candy tampering can be traced back to the 1950s. Some believe that it was a fear that had long since been brewing in the public during the post-industrial age. Food had gone from homemade to factory-made. No one knew where their food was coming from, who handled it, or what was really in it. While most cases of poisoned candy and pins and needles and blades hidden in apples turned out to be pranks or hoaxes, some of those reports were unfortunately true. In 1959, a California dentist by the name of William Shine handed out 450 laxative lace candies to children. 30 of the children became sick, but fortunately recovered. He was charged with outrage of public decency and unlawful dispensing of drugs. Somebody should have told Dr. Shine that this was not the way to prevent cavities. A few years later, in 1964, in Greenlong, Long Island, a woman by the name of Helen Feel, a.k.a. the Grinch who stole Halloween, decided that she was going to punish older children who decided to partake in trick-or-treating by handing out various treats. And you can't see me, but I just did air quotes when I said the word treats, because these, in fact, were nothing of the sort. They included dog biscuits wrapped in foil, metal scouring pads, and arsenic ant traps. Helen handed out 12 ant traps in total, and thankfully all of them were recovered and no one was hurt. They were first discovered by a father in a nearby town of Centerport. His daughters, ages 13 and 15 years old, had both received an arsenic ant trap in their treat bag. He reported it, and they were eventually traced back to Fields' home, and her arrest followed soon after. Feel's husband claimed that his wife loved children and that this was just a joke, but no one found anything funny about it, especially the judge presiding at her arraignment. She pled guilty to endangering children and served a suspended sentence, along with undergoing psychiatric evaluation and observation. Up until this time, thankfully, no one had died or suffered any serious injuries as a result of receiving disguised treats. It wouldn't be until 10 years later, in 1974, when one man would turn fear into fatality. Ronald Clark O'Brien lived in Deer Park, Texas, with his wife and two children. He was an all-around fuck-up who was buried in debt and couldn't hold a job to save his life. Seriously, he had been fired from 21 jobs in the past year alone. He was described as having a short, fiery temper. On that Halloween night, after having dinner with a friend, Jim Bates, and his family, the two fathers decided that they were going to take the kids trick-or-treating. They went from house to house, as one normally does. Eventually, they came upon a dark house, and although it looked as if no one was home, they knocked anyway. Naturally, no one answered, so the families moved on to the next house. Well, that is, everyone but Ronald. He lagged behind, and when he finally caught up to everyone, he was holding a bunch of giant pixie sticks in his hand. At first, he told everyone that wealthy neighbors had handed out the candy. He later changed his story, but we'll get to that in a minute. He distributed the candy between his two children, the Bates children, and one trick-or-treater that Ronald had recognized from the church he worshipped at. The families ended the evening and returned to their respective homes. Later that night, Ronald's eight-year-old son, Timothy, had requested to have one piece of candy before bedtime. And while Timothy's mother attests that her son wanted a lollipop, what he instead received from his father was the pixie sticks. 
The boy ate some of the candy and complained that it had a bitter taste. He was given a drink of Kool-Aid to wash it down and was sent to bed. It wasn't long before Timothy started to complain of stomach pain and became violently ill. He died on the way to the hospital, officially pronounced dead at 10.30 p.m. An autopsy report determined Timothy's cause of death to be cyanide poisoning. In fact, it was concluded that the boy had enough potassium cyanide in his system to kill at least two adults. Police promptly started investigating the child's death. Out of the five pixie sticks that Ronald had shared, Timothy was the only one who ingested the poison. The other four children, including his daughter, were safe. After police spoke with the other two families who received the candy, they noticed something very strange about it that immediately sent their spidey senses tingling. The pixie sticks appeared to have been opened and were stapled back together. The candy, which is basically just a flavored, smooth and fine sugar powder, was hard and clumped. In an attempt to trace the poison candy and prevent any more fatalities, police spoke with Ronald and asked him to retrace the steps of the evening. And here's where he changes his story. Originally, Ronald had mentioned that wealthy neighbors had handed out the poison pixie sticks, but when speaking with the police officers, he said he actually received the candy from that one dark house that appeared as if no one was home. Ronald had said that in fact someone did open the door, but just enough for a single hairy arm to reach out of the darkness and hold out a fistful of pixie sticks. Um, okay, Ronald. Further investigation revealed that the man with the hairy-ass arm who lived in the super dark house was an air traffic controller who was at work that evening, with many an eyewitness vouching for him and his hairy arms. The police now turned their eyes to Ronald. After looking into this jagweed a little further, they found that he had defaulted on a loan, was on the brink of being fired from his current job, and was over $100,000 in debt. And, most disturbing of all, they found out that just days before his son's death, he had taken an insurance policy out on both of his children. The combined policies would have been conveniently enough to get Ronald out of debt. See where I'm going with this? Within days of Timothy's death, Ronald was arrested. During his trial, witnesses came forward and testified that they had heard Ronald ask how one could obtain cyanide and joked about how much it would take to kill someone. What a piece of fucking shit. It didn't take long for the jury to find him guilty. And after nearly 10 years of attempted appeals, he received the death penalty. On March 31st, 1984, Ronald Clark O'Brien, also known as the Candyman, died by lethal injection. During the 80s, fears of tampered candy were compounded when, a month before Halloween in 1982, Seven people died as a result of unknowingly ingesting cyanide-laced Tylenol capsules. The Tylenol poisonings rocked the Chicago area, and it's a crime that still remains unsolved to this day. The FDA hypothesized that a citizen had purchased the Tylenol, laced the capsules, resealed the bottles, and placed them back on the shelves. However, the Illinois Attorney General pointed the finger at Tylenol manufacturing and packaging factories. They hypothesized that it was an employee who undertook the tampering and hoped to strike at random. Regardless, Tylenol and its parent company, Johnson & Johnson, quickly recalled the medication. And while no other related deaths had been reported, the damage had already been done. Innocent and unsuspecting lives had been lost while these individuals had purchased and ingested a product that was supposed to be safe and regulated. How was the public supposed to feel safe going to a stranger's home and trusting that they weren't being fed anything fatal? Personally, I did most of my trick-or-treating in the 90s, and I distinctly remember not being allowed to touch a single friggin' kernel of candy corn until it had been inspected by my parents. Anything that wasn't in a pristine sealed wrapper was tossed. Anything that was loose, unwrapped, or could be unwrapped and rewrapped, tossed. And not gonna lie, I'd do the same thing if I were a parent today, because trust issues. <laughs> Woven throughout this timeline, there have also been rumors of another kind of treat tampering, the insertion of pins, needles, or razor blades into candy as well as apples. Imagine how terrifying this legend was to hear. It's shitty enough that someone wants to give a kid a fucking piece of fruit on what's arguably considered a child's greatest cheat day. 
a day designed around candy, but now we're adding razor blades into the mix? I mean, definitely don't fuck with Halloween treats in general, but like also don't give kids pieces of fruit for Halloween. Because I'm telling you right now, razor blade or not, it's going right in the garbage. Anyway, while reports of sharp-ass daggery fruit go back to the late 50s and 60s with dozens of occurrences reported, there is fortunately only one reported injury. And there's nothing fortunate about someone being injured by this, it's just good that more people weren't injured by this, just to clarify. <laughs> Almost all cases, thankfully, turn out to be pranks or hoaxes. The one verified case, though, was in Minneapolis, Minnesota on Halloween night in the year 2000. 49-year-old James Joseph Smith was arrested and tried for one count of adulterating a substance with intent to cause death, harm, or illness when he handed out several candy bars to trick-or-treaters that he had shoved needles into. Only one 14-year-old boy suffered a minor injury when he bit into the candy bar. Thankfully, he required no emergent medical attention. It's hard to say whether James actually knew the consequences of his actions or not, as he was later deemed unfit for trial, and there was a petition to have him sent to a mental health facility for treatment. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. And whether you believe in urban legends, whether you'll be out trick-or-treating, or staying in and watching a scary movie and eating rubbish food like I'll be doing... I want to take a moment to wish you a very happy, safe, cyanide-free Halloween sans razor blades. Thank you all so much for joining me. I'll see you next time, and stay spooky, friends. Mm -hmm.